I guess my question is like, did, did you in the end, when you finished the film, have a more profound sense of his sociopathic behavior? Or, or actually did you think that his predicament, and the predicament at times, was structural, or both? Uh, to answer the question, did I have a more profound sense of his sociopathic behavior? Um, my feelings about Jason really vacillated through the process of making this film. Um, he is a really difficult subject, and it took a long time to get him to come on board. Um, but at the end of the day, I have really strong, really conflicting feelings about him. Did you like him? Well, he's a subject that I'm reporting on, so as a journalist, I'm technically not supposed to like or not like. Well, I think that's a bit extreme. <laughs> I don't, I, don't um, think. I, I, I don't feel that um, he ever really was completely forthcoming with accepting or even possibly understanding what he had done. I mean, he ruined people's lives. And he really shattered the faith in, that the public had about the New York Times. This was the, this was the biggest scandal that the Times had ever had. And it really kind of shook the foundations, the last vestige of an institution that hadn't suffered uh, a plagiarism. Okay, well, let's, like let's put this into context before we go. You know, the British media have been rocked by um, mass criminal behavior, actually, in which many people go to jail at News International. And the BBC, where I work, um, it, it emerged that they had harbored and promoted the career of a mass serial child abuser. And you might say that these are, what you describe, um, is actually quite small scale compared to the abuses in the British media. Why well, am I wrong about this? Should we have a show of hands? You're right, yeah. I'm right, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean you're, you're dealing with, look, you're dealing with a very reputable, very angsty liberal institution which has one employee who, for a variety of reasons, probably was allowed to get away with things a bit longer than he should have done. But isn't there a degree of overreaction in the old times? Always? Well, I mean, I think they really held themselves to this standard. And this was the first time that they were, uh, they encountered somebody who had intentionally deceived them. And I think they were really vulnerable to that. They sort of thought of themselves as the high and mighty New York Times. And we're all living by this code that journalists live by and no one is going to do this inside of our ranks. And I think that was a little naive. He could have consciously deceived them without quite intentionally deceiving them. Uh, well, I don't what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, his degrees of his fraud show a certain compulsive behavior um, that if you're rational, you'd know that you'd get by that. And he went and did it all the same. So it, it does imply a level of um, dysfunction in his behavior that isn't, doesn't quite indicate consciousness or responsibility. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, he, he is a figure, as I say, I believe that he is mentally ill. I think that that is true. You think he's still mentally ill? I think he's medicated. Um, but, you know, he is being treated still for mental illness, and I think he does have a mental disorder. Um, I also am enraged by his behavior as a journalist. Um, I think it's, you know, it's against the code. You just don't do that. Um, you, you can't, because it, it, it's a price, there's a price for all the rest of us to pay when one person does this. And then the public thinks, oh, the media is all corrupt, journalists are liars, and that's just not true. The, the vast majority who get, of people who get into journalism don't get into it for the fame or certainly for the money, because there is none. Um, you get into it because you have a sense of uh, the importance of shining a light of truth on, on things. I think that would surprise Rupert Murdoch's employees. <laughs> Let's have some questions. Any questions? At the back. I think you may have hit on a completely different um, subject though, which is 
uh, why the New York Times is in such financial trouble, because apparently people lose cars, run up hundred dollar <laughs> car tabs, and most astonishingly, as far as I can see, get applied to Texas, Cleveland, and uh, other places without ever producing a receipt which might prove whether or not they've actually been there. Did, did anyone ever manage anything there? I mean, I, um, having worked in, that's in a very good newspapers question. and television in Britain, I've had to produce bus tickets from one end of Liverpool to another to justify a 45p claim. And uh, yeah. I find that astonishing, absolutely astonishing, that they're all running around ringing people saying, were you asked anything by anyone? And no one says, where were your air tickets to Texas? Um, before I answer that question, I just want to say quickly, we have a sign-up sheet going around, so please um, sign up for our newsletter if you have a minute. Um, and I also just want to say thank you all for coming. I didn't get a chance to say that. Um, this is our world premiere, and it's really great to have you all here. So thanks for, for sharing this. So the, the um, question is, is the New York Times so sloppily managed that? Um, you might say, actually, he gave him a very good deal. He never went to places, so the stories were coming in more cheaply. And that would appeal to the BBC. Um, if well, only, was he billing if, them for air travel? No, he was billing them for his bar tab. I mean, he, he was running up the bar tab. Um, and, you know... Or oh, did he it, claim that imaginary plane flights that while they were going up his nose? Is that what was going on? I mean? So, he never turned in receipts, and because he was moving from department to department to department, no one was really tracking that. Um, in addition, you know, his credit cards were completely racked up with his social behavior, uh, meaning his bar tabs, and I don't... Last I checked, you can't charge cocaine to your credit card, um, but, you know... Um, so so I, how, I how was he um, accounting, the, you didn't put this in the film sheet, how was he accounted for the mass of white stuffs and going up his nose? And, how was he paying for it? Uh, no, how did he manage to f defraud the New York Times by putting it on his expenses? Uh, uh, the, his drug use? Yeah. He wasn't. I don't oh, think I he was. I think he was collecting his paycheck, um, but he was using it for drinking and other things. I mean, maybe he was using his paycheck for drugs. He was getting paid for his work, um, but he wasn't being asked to turn in receipts. But they never thought it weird that he said he'd been in Texas and didn't put in an ashtray. No, I agree. And, and ultimately, when it came out that this was a little fishy, that's when they asked him for receipts. And he actually considered fabricating all the receipts. Well, and a, a practice well known to every journalist in the <laughs> Another question. <laughs> yes? Oh, is that by you need a mic? Um, to what extent do you think that the system exacerbated his mental illness? So, do you think that he was just an anomaly or a symptom of a system that maybe puts too much pressure, maybe wants things to be delivered to the point where humans are stretched beyond the infinity? Um, so, did you guys hear that question? Yeah. Um, yeah, is, was, it, is, it, is the system so great, uh, the pressure so great in the New York Times that it pushes people towards deviant behavior? Yes, yeah. I think the answer to that question could potentially be yes. I, that, think that, I mean, look, I've worked for American publications, British publications. I'll tell you, it's ten times as bad in Britain. The pressure in Britain is so enormous compared yeah. to anything that, you know, you are pussycats compared to, <laughs> you know. So well, I I've never worked inside the New York Times, but I think the 24-7 news cycle does put an insane amount of pressure on people. And frankly, the industry is in a panic because, you know, revenues are dropping, newspapers are closing, like there's no tomorrow. And so there is this intense pressure to produce. Did it cause his mental illness? I don't think so. Did it cause his behavior? Yes. She said exacerbated. I, I don't, I mean, I don't know if it's... it's not, but it, there's a difference between cause and Causing. Cause and exacerbate are different <laughs> words with different meanings. Yeah. Did it exacerbate his mental illness? I think probably the fact that he was under a lot of stress could have potentially, but I, I actually am not, uh, I'm not an expert in mental illness, so I don't know if those two things go together. But I mean, to, to kind of follow on from that, to kind of give that credence, isn't that sort of playing Jason's game a little bit? That, you know, the directness, <laughs> the, the structural problem that someone got forced into this situation where the pressure is or other, unlike the pressure which clearly did not affect the, the vast majority of other journalists who do, do not under the same pressure and do not lie. Um, so is that, so is, you know, is there a danger of trying to mesh between Jason's story, which is 
both the interesting and the frightening of how a sociopath can function, someone who's ill or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then the broader questions about the problems of media industry and, mm -hmm. and, and fact and truth. Is there, is, there, is there a danger of running those two things together? Yes, there is. And I think that that's what all the media reporting was saying around the story. And that's why in this film I'm saying this story is not representative. Jason Blair is not representative of anything, really, but Jason Blair. Lots of questions. Next one. Don't you think that he really enjoyed lying? Just make it up. <laughs> he really enjoyed lying. Like, is that a trait of journalists as well as <laughs> telling the truth? I hope not. <laughs> um, well, I know a lot of journalists who are fantasists. Um, did he just really enjoy lying? I, you know, in dealing with him as a subject, um, I did think many times, wow, it must be really exhausting to be Jason Blair because he is always got something going on. And, you know, he certainly, I think he enjoys being a player. I think he enjoys kind of being in the game. Um, and I think he discovered he couldn't be in the game without lying. Yeah, nice. to play devil's advocate for a minute, um, do you not think, obviously journalism is a broad church, it's not just news reporting, there's entertainment. What makes them something, something of a trailblazer with a kind of collagist approach? To take a trailblazer? <laughs> a a collagist? <laughs> you know, if you, if you put him in entertainment reporting, where the veracity of sources is not not such a big issue. I think what you're saying, I hope this is not being recorded, but you mean if he was introduced to Rupert Murdoch, he would have a flourishing career. I'm asking for whether his approach was, was appropriate to, to new developments in journalism, which were alluded to over here by the speed and the deadlines and the sources and Twitter and Facebook, when nobody's allowed to think. And this is so, personal, by the way. I'm never very happy. With <laughs> so, uh, just to answer that question, you know, this happened in 2003. Mm -hmm. And this was really kind of at the in the nascent stages of people using... Um, the internet for reporting. And I think some of the older editors really weren't using the internet and really weren't that aware of the internet. So he really leveraged that new power um, in a way that people were not prepared for. Do you mean that they wouldn't have known how to check that he pilfered pieces out of other newspapers? It's not that they wouldn't. they didn't go on the internet to check it. It's, well, they certainly don't go on the internet to check it. I mean, you know, fact checking is, is a whole other very interesting conversation. Um, they didn't go to check it, and you know, it's still they still don't. But I think back in the day, they were, the editors maybe weren't even aware of the fact that Jason could so quickly and easily just get access to all of this, all these other articles. Well, and I think the other thing that's important to point out is also that the New York Times is syndicated all across the U.S. and all across the world. So he can't be an example. You can't compare it to entertainment news because I hope that entertainment news is being syndicated you know, across plat multiple platforms. But do you think that entertainment uh, news should, doesn't have this, apply to the same ethical rules that you should try and tell what's happening? No, I just meant that journalism is a broad church. It involves, very, it involves different kind of elements. You mean journalism consists of some truths and many lies? Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> he said that, not me. <laughs> um, how much do you think he was hiding behind, um, I felt he was hiding behind that whole mental illness thing a little bit. How bad is his mental illness? What is his mental illness? And what is that dateline thing that New York Times do? It seems generally that's that's quite shocking. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, he has been diagnosed, or I. So I've never seen his paperwork from his um, doctor. Um, he has told me, um, and I believe based on some of his behavior, as a complete non-expert that he has bipolar disorder. Um, and he's written about it, it's been reported about by many, many different publications. Whether any of those publications have gone to his doctor's office and said, can I see the prescription? I don't know. Um, and what was the second part of your question? Oh, it's just the dateline thing where it seems that they- Oh, the toe touch. Yeah. The toe touch reporting. The story then go, what a waste of money. I, I think that that was also something that happened back in the glory days of journalism. They're not doing that now. Uh, at the back. Um, just in, in terms of the process of this film, um, from the credits you say that it started out as a short when you were still at journalism school, so I just wonder how you got it from that to a feature doc, which is a pretty big achievement. And at what stage Blair came on board, because um, you did there were at least two to three different interviews in there, at what stage she came on board and whether he stayed on board throughout the filming? 
Great question. So this film started when I was in graduate school for journalism as a thesis film, and no one wanted to talk to me. As you can imagine, no one from the New York Times ever wants to talk about this again, and Jason Blair certainly didn't want to talk to me. Um, the one person that did come on board was Macarena Hernandez, who was very reluctant, but she did come on board and was willing to kind of get the film started. So over the course of that year that I was making that short version of the film, um, I had to convince people. And I was able to convince almost everyone, but Jason was an especially hard nut to crack. Um, in fact, I did my research and I got his email address, and I started emailing him, and I emailed him every week for several months. You know, I would write long emails like, this is what I'm doing, you should really participate, blah, 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 blah. And he wasn't even responding to my emails, but they weren't bouncing back. So I guessed that he was getting them. And at a certain point, I found his address, and I wrote him an email with the title, I'm coming to your house at blah, 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 address. And that got his attention. And when he got that email, he did respond. And he said, please don't come to my house. That's an invasion of my privacy. I'm really sick right now. So I said to him, OK, I won't come. But I already have my tickets. I'm coming there to shoot another film. So I'll be in this coffee shop, which is one mile from your house, from 9 to 5. And I really think you should come talk to me. Because you've got nothing to lose. I won't have my recorder. I just want to talk to you. And he did not come, but I think that that really got his attention, and he realized, okay, this girl is going to make this film, so maybe I should at least engage in a conversation with her. And he never came on board for the short film, but I realized I could use the audiobook, his audio memoir, which is him reading his memoir, to stand in for his voice, which is how those sections actually came to be. Um, and. It was only after the student film was completed that he called me up and said, hey, if, you, if you're still interested in doing this, I would be willing to sit down and do the interview with you, you know, do an exclusive interview with you. And um, that was, that was a, how many years ago? <laughs> it was a few years. Yeah, it took a long time. Um, and also, the last person to come on board was actually Hal Raines. And so that was in the last year or so, which was a real, added a lot to the story, a lot of complexity. Do you think how Rains got, we going on the question, but he got a very bad deal, really, because he didn't. I mean, do you think he should have resigned? Um, I, he was, was forced, he fired, he was right? forced he was to resign, yeah. Do you think that was right? Or? I think it was a really harsh punishment for some poor management. Um, I mean, honestly, I think that, you know, besides <laughs> the public and the Anguiano family, I think the two editors are the real victims. And I don't know if you all caught that, that Gerald Boyd, who was, I should mention, the first African-American editor at the New York Times ever. He was a real groundbreaking um, success story, hugely successful, an incredible editor, uh, lost his job because of this. By the way, it was not Jason Blair's mentor, but was painted to be Jason Blair's mentor simply because both men were black. Um, he died. He died three years after the scandal. You know, and stress and illness often do go together. He'd never been sick a day in his life, and three years later, he died. He was 56. So. Very, very nicely made film. Um, I'm just wondering, I, I was surprised to hear in your question answer that he wasn't very keen to uh, participate, because I thought he was thoroughly enjoying participating with you. Um, and I'm, it's my profession. I'm not going to say which it is. Uh, but I'm surprised that he's also working as a life coach. And who goes to him? And maybe your film has helped him to even have more time than 200. So I think what you're getting at is, is Jason Blair just doing this for self-promotion? Um, and that's a, that's a tough one. It's hard, it's hard to say. You know, when I asked him, because everyone asked me, why would he do this? What is his motivation? And so I said to him, what's your answer to that question? Because I don't want to have to figure it out. And his answer to that question was, I still had a lot of unanswered questions myself about what happened. And I was hoping that maybe you and your work could shed some more light on the subject for not, not only everybody else, but also me. Yeah. Um, has Jason seen the finished film? He has not. No one from the Times or Jason. You are the first group of people to see it. I, I, I plan to share it with 
all of them. Um, Jason has told me that he will not watch the film. I don't believe that. Um, I am hopeful that he will come to the U.S. premiere of the film, but we'll see. What is that? Uh, we're still figuring out the details of that right now. Okay, I'm, thank you very much for a very illuminating Q&A and a very, very interesting film indeed. Thanks so much. Thank you.